Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of our Journey to DU series here so that you can try to get some idea of what it would be like to study here at the University of Denver, even if we're still unable to interact in person as we would really like to. Uh, but we're just so thankful that you're here right now in this virtual setting, and we just thank you so much for uh, just taking time out of your day to just come and join us here. And um, uh, just for introductions, my name is AJ Lee, and I am an admission counselor here at the University of Denver. And I'm thrilled to see all of you here to, uh, for today's sample class for international studies. And uh, I want to remind everyone before we begin that the chat function is disabled for this webinar, but the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen is on and is a great way for uh, you to give us any questions that you have related to what our presenter uh, will be talking about today. And today I am joined by my colleague here, uh, Keith Gehring, uh, who knows a lot more about the subject that we're gonna be presenting on today. So I will pass the mic uh, out to him. Uh, thank you, AJ. So what we're going to do today is, uh, as a sample class, uh, kind of give a high overview, as it were, of one of the uh, kind of cool things that we do at the Corbell School of International Studies. Uh, and then actually, because it's a piece of software that we use and use with a lot of different groups, we'll go into that piece of software um, so that we can kind of see how the world might look in the years to come. So first and foremost, I'm going to share my screen and do the presentation as it were. And you'll see a couple of things going on there. You'll see the fact that I am uh, Dr. Keith Gehring. I'm a professor at the Corbell School of International Studies. Um, but I'm also a uh, what's known as a faculty affiliate with the Pardee Center for International Futures. And that's top left there. Um, might be flipped on your screen. But anyway, um, and the Corbell School is uh, fairly interesting in, the, in that we have a number of different research centers. And the Party Center happens to be uh, both the largest and, in my opinion, the most interesting because we do something that's relatively unique in international studies and social sciences more broadly. And that is we build long term forecasts and long term forecasts on uh, a variety of different uh, systems, whether those are human, social or physical systems for 186 countries out to 2100. Um, so let's go ahead and get started and talk about what that might actually be. Um, it helps to understand what International Futures is. International Futures is the software model that we use. It's an integrated assessment model. Um, and we use it uh, to build out these long-term forecasts. Um, and it's integrated because we kind of think that you really can't build out any single forecast without understanding the interrelatedness of, again, these uh, human, social, and physical systems. And only when we understand those complex relationships can we say something meaningful about what populations might be or what economic growth might look like or what the environment uh, might be like in the years to come. There are plenty of folks that do demography models, economic models, and uh, climate change or environmental models exclusively, and they're complex in their own right. Um, but again, our approach through using an integrated assessment model is to tap into all of these systems and understand how they uh, work. And to do so, we look to the past first. We understand the trends. And this is where science helps us out. We understand the trends as to why things occur as they do, whatever those patterns might be, what informs those patterns, so that we can create those dynamics within the model and build out the long-term forecasts. So that's different than extrapolation. Not that there is an endurance in, in any aspect of any system, as it were, but we need to understand the system dynamics themselves to build out these long-term forecasts. And we do so so that we can understand what's going on, again, whether those are human, social, or physical systems, how they interact, and what that might look like in the future. Now that's helpful to just understand what might be going on and what might happen in the years to come, but the what I think really separates international futures or ifs from many other systems is that we allow the user to build out their own assumptions. We allow the users to change the assumptions within the model, either through policy or through a different perspective, and then build altogether new forecasts, new scenarios, as it were, uh, based on the choices that we make. Um, so ostensibly, it's to shape our understanding, but then actually begin to tackle some of these issues that might be out there. Now, um, let me see if I can move on. Oh, went too far, sorry about that. 
go back a little bit. Uh, so who uses ifs? Uh, interestingly uh, enough, a lot of different groups, not only us at the Corbell Center, uh, excuse me, the party, party center at the Corbell School, but also national governments, international organizations, and a variety of other um, groups as well. It makes sense that the national that national governments, especially as you can see here, we have like the, uh, the National Intelligence Council, uh, we also have USAID and the Department of Defense. Um, obviously, the United States and the United States government is a strategic thinker and wants to understand how things might unfold in the years to come. And again, the policy interventions that we might be able to employ to change uh, what we might expect in the future. But obviously, the questions that USAID, who is focused on eradicating poverty, are very different for the most part, than the questions that the Department of Defense might ask. And interestingly enough, I've worked on projects for both entities. And the only way that we can build an integrated assessment model is through answering the very different questions that these two or any of these other organizations might ask. So of course, we have a number of UN um, and related agencies focused on poverty or development more broadly, whether that's the UNDP, uh, NEPAD, a IA, uh, DB. Um, and then, of course, focused on climate change through UNEP and IPCC or uh, regional integration through the European Commission. Um, the next most relevant group would be think tanks, again, to be able to think strategically about the long term. Um, so think tanks, we do a lot of work with regards to security in Africa through ISS the Atlantic Council and RAND Corporation out in California, um, and then less so with private uh, entities or private for-profit entities or non-governmental organizations, uh, mainly because their, their questions are much more of a near-term horizon and not really this long-term uh, consideration out to, for all intents and purposes, an additional 80 years. But those are the groups that work with us, and we work with them. Um, and I'll go to the next slide here and talk about what we actually do. Variety of things. Um, I'll start in the top left there. Uh, focus on policy analysis and capacity building. Again, if we kind of know or think we know how the future might unfold for a variety of different indicators for a particular unit, whether that's a country or region, we can then say, are we satisfied with that? Can we do better, especially in a developing country context? Can we do better? Can we eradicate poverty sooner? Can we preserve the environment sooner? Um, those might be the questions that we would want to ask so that we can then implement specific, specific policies to then realize those targets. And of course, the most important targets that we have on a global level are the sustainable development goals. Uh, 17 very clear uh, goals with a litany of targets um, in each and every one of them. And for all the countries that are participating with the SDGs, we help them figure out what the path is that they're on for the eradication of hunger, the eradication of poverty, uh, gender empowerment, what have you, um, we figure out what the base case is that they're on for any one of those uh, goals. And then we figure out, that again, the policies that we can implement that will help them realize those goals sooner. We can also ask not so specific questions. So the former is kind of what, what might happen if we actually did invest more in education or healthcare or what have you. The second is kind of what might happen that we might not expect. Uh, and these are, these can be anything. Uh, they can be what happens if we have global conflict? What happens if we have a pandemic that's far worse than the already devastating one that we have now? But we can ask these questions so that we can at least prepare for and uh, begin to have some sort of mitigation strategy um, by at least asking those questions. Model extension is kind of what it sounds like there. At every step of the way, we're building out the model itself. It's been around for 40 years and grown significantly uh, since its origin. But at every step of the way, as we work with different groups and they ask their questions, we ask ours through collaboration, we figure out new um, extensions to the model itself. But last and certainly not least is um, knowledge and learning. And this is really where uh, I'm deeply involved at the party center. We teach this, we teach this to our undergraduate students, we teach this to our graduate students, and it really helps them understand not only how the way, how the world works, um, but again, what we might expect and how they can through their choices um, begin to shape the world that they would want. Um, Harry uh, theore asks, theoretically, could one attempt to do a model if something in the past changed? And I'm, I'm 
let me see if I can answer that. We we do have we do have what we would might call backcasting. So, but I'm trying to think of what might right. Backcasting is simply we don't build um, forecast per se. We but we go back to some point in time and say what might have happened if we did things differently. You know what might have happened if we mitigated the 2000. Uh, eight, nine recession differently. And yes, we can go backwards and then change the decision making that actually did occur and backcast uh, forward into what would have been an alternative. And we could have done the same with COVID-19 as well. Um, so there, so I, Harry, I hope that answered your question. Um, but Point of fact, yes, we can actually do that. We can build forecasts at a point in time that has already passed and look at what would have happened if we had chose differently. Um, cool, okay, so that answered that question. Let's go on and how we actually get this done. We do it with an amazing amount of data from most of the international organizations that curate all this data. Um, and these are just uh, some of the data providers that are out there, but it's a data intensive model. We, we curate data from a number of different resources and that track everything from populations, to GDP rates to mobile phones, et cetera. And we incorporate that into uh, the IFS system. And then we have all of these relationships built out into the system itself. So the way to think of it is a large database with a lot of math, a lot of algorithmic work that then represents what we think of as the causal relationships based on, again, what we know in science, um, and then replicated into the model to build out our long-term forecasts. And these are the main modules that we actually look at. We start with the human systems at the top there. Uh, people counted through demography and their ages, um, the education that they are able to obtain, and the lives that they're able to live through healthy, hopefully healthy, long lives. We then get into, again, the social uh, layer there in the middle. And that involves uh, the economy, um, governance, more or less what governments do. And when we talk about finance, we're talking about what governments spend their money on and how they obtain their revenue. That, of course, is how a lot of policies are enacted. And then, of course, how um, different societies relate with one another through international politics. And then we have all of the physical systems. And again, all of these systems are informed by us. So Agriculture is the natural world, but meant to work for us so that we can get the sustenance we need and crops for uh, things like um, clothing, what have you, textiles more broadly, uh, technology, um, infrastructure, uh, the environment, and of course, energy to make the world work. As I mentioned, our units of analysis are 186 countries. We don't include all countries, and we include some entities that wouldn't be traditional nation states, as it were, Puerto Rico or Palestine uh, or even Taiwan or Hong Kong. Uh, so we have 186 units for all intents and purposes. Um, and then with a subset of those, we can actually go down to the, in the US, that'd be the state level, provincial level, um, if we're looking elsewhere, but we can only do that for a handful. So we could actually do forecasts for the state of Colorado and a handful of other countries at the lower sub-state level. Um, we can also do grouping. So we might want to look at the EU as a single entity, NATO as a single entity, uh, what have you, or just geography, the entire continent of Africa. And then G lists are interesting combinations of all of these. So we can look at actually a province in China and compare that to a country in Europe, or uh, compare that with ECOWAS, the entire GDP, as it were, of a region of Africa. Um, so that's just the interesting combinations that we can come up with. Um, and the interesting thing, I think, uh, or compelling thing, or at, at the end of the day, the most uh, relevant thing is that we are completely transparent in what we do. Uh, other people have other models, and some of those are black boxes, as it were, in which they kind of keep all the secrets to themselves. We don't do that. We um, keep our software as open source. You can go into it. You can see all the equations that we use to actually build the relationships in the model. Um, and you can download it and use it yourself just by clicking right there, party.du.edu. Uh, you can use it online. Uh, you can, like I said, download the whole version. And of course, you have access to our help system and documentation. But this is all just PowerPoint, and I would rather actually go into the model itself. So if everyone's OK, I will go ahead and move over to it. 
So um, one thing that you'll immediately notice is that it's not the best looking software on the planet. And that's because we don't have the budgets of uh, the folks that are in Silicon Valley. Um, and point of fact, we're academics. So we're more interested in just what it can do, not necessarily how good it looks. So bear with me. Um, what I'm going to do is start with kind of the basics. And one of the most basic indicators we would look at is population. And you can see over here on the left side, we have all of our categories. And then over here in the middle, we have all of the displays or indicators that go along with that particular category. And of course, we're looking for populations. And in this instance, I want to pick the entire world, which hopefully I've done. Now, I'm going to build this forecast just out to 2050. And we'll take a look and we'll ask a question. All right. so. We have what I would call a positive linear, what looks like a positive linear relationship right here out to 2050. And we kind of grow from roughly the uh, 7.75, um, almost 7.8 billion individuals that we have currently. And that grows to roughly just shy of 10 billion individuals. And the question is, what happens next? What happens to uh, the total world population when we go outside of 2050 and into 2100? Is it a continual linear relationship? Do we think it's going to grow even more quickly or do we think it's going to actually decline or what we would call saturate kind of plain out? Any thoughts? You can just type into the Q&A if you say higher, lower. Okay, we'll just hop in and see what actually happens. So to do that, we'll just close this and we'll move our horizon out to 2100. And lo and behold, we actually saturate. And you can see it's actually arcing down a little bit there, but we kind of top out somewhere around 10.5 billion individuals in the world population. And this is pretty much in line. There you go, Harry's already rolling there. Birth rates become lower, so saturate or decline. Um, Harry's absolutely right. And this is an incredibly important um, transition within demography. And it is the recognition that while all societies are unique in their ways, that for all intents and purposes, most families realize a replacement level at maybe 2.1, if not even lower births per woman over her entire life. And that will cause ultimately the population to kind of saturate, if not begin to decline, if it goes below the 2.1 replacement ratio, which we see in so many countries. So yes, the point of fact is we will have high growth in the, um, the world as a lot of still developing countries still have higher fertility rates than the replacement ratio. But as all of those societies ultimately realize a decent standard of living, they'll have fewer children. And we know this. We know this through uh, pretty much every society in the world that as incomes improve, uh, women have fewer children. And that's the truism that we should expect in the years to come. And we can look at that through uh, measures like economy uh, GDP per capita. And we can look at that in either market exchange rate terms or purchase power to parity terms, which is again, more based on what one can actually buy with their currency, um, irrespective of exchange rates between, currency, uh, between currencies and nations. And if we look at a line graph there, we can see very clearly that on average, the world income per capita will be somewhere around 27,000 um, in 2011 US dollars on average. Um, and uh, that'll be a game changer in so much in so many ways. And we have to ask, ask the question, why do we think that GDP will grow so much on average per individual as populations continue to grow as well over this horizon just out to 2050? Any thoughts? Harry, would you, would you like to jump in as well again or anyone else? Right. Well, that's totally fine. Let's think about what's actually happening. And when I think about the generations before me, my grandmother, for example, did not finish high school. And my increase, certainly, so the lower population, when we get way out into 2100, if we continue to grow, that's more growth for fewer individuals to share. But even during that high growth period, we see incomes rise as well. And we think of that uh, occurring because, as I was saying, the um, 
so so much has changed. Like again, my grandmother who didn't finish high school versus my mother and father who were first generation in college, finished college, to myself who is a PhD um, and who knows what my children will do, but they will have so much education. You will have so much education and you'll have so much more technology, right? Um, you are digital natives. Uh, most of you for, for all intents and purposes participating and you'll use technology in ways that were inconceivable even in my uh, youth when I was one of the few kids who had a computer in um, elementary, junior high and, and so forth and so on. Um, so these are the endowments that we'll have that will be transformative in the years to come. We also expect better governance, and things like that, better ways to solve the problems. And all these things would come together to inform multi-factor productivity and enable all societies to grow at, more, at a, hopefully a faster rate. Well, not a faster rate, just that that growth doesn't end. So it's accretive and builds on all the growth that we've had in the past. And so too, would we have a reduction in poverty? So we can look at the percentage of individuals either at the 110 or the 310 level, and this includes both the history as well as our forecast. And you can see uh, the messy past, which just has to do with, you know, when countries actually sample poverty and that, but still, even if you take a weighted average, you would see a downward trajectory from incredibly high rates just in the 1980s to where we really are now in our forecasted values. But unfortunately, if I zoom in on those, you can still see that a significant percentage of the population is still living in either a higher level at the 310 level or at the bare minimum level, the uh, ninety. And if we think about the sustainable development goals going out to 2030, it is to eradicate poverty. And unfortunately, we won't do it, at least in the base case. So again, this is a point in where we work with the UNDP and work with various national governments to say, unfortunately, we will not realize that target based on what we've done thus far, decision-wise and uh, through the system dynamics of the model. But that isn't to say that implementing different policies, we can't actually eradicate poverty much more sooner. I'm going to shift gears now, if you're okay with that, and go into a, another realm that I think is quite compelling, power. So um, kind of talked about populations, physical, talked about the social uh, through the economy. Now we're talking about the interrelatedness between states. Um, still on a state by state basis and a lot of different ways that you can measure power. You can just look at military spending. You can look at technological advancement. You can look at the size of the population and, and, and how wealthy they are. Um, and you can also look at the international institutions that those states then inform. And hopefully I'll get some input from our folks on the discussion today. I'm gonna to start with one country at random. That one country being the United States of America. All right, and I'm gonna to go to just where we are now and do a line graph of power. This is one measure, this is one measure that we use that incorporates again, a lot of the things that are already talked about military spending, the economy, the size of the population, technology, and uh, institutions or, you know, kind of the, the agreements and the projection of our way of doing things or the United States way of doing things into the uh, international system. And you can see a bit of variation and certainly the uh, difficult times uh, that I don't really remember, I was about three, but anyway, difficult times that we had and the rise and fall. But you can see that the United States, as we kind of move into uh, where we are now is declining in its share of power. And that's what this is. So the index here is actually a share of world power. In the United States currently, we would estimate has a share of world power that's about 22.4%. Total world power, the United States is 22.4%. So who are the other major powers in the world? Any thoughts? And how might this change in the years to come? Now, remember, that's relative power, that's share of world power. The United States still becomes more powerful. The population grows. Americans become more educated, have more technology, have more GDP, all of those uh, very important attributes. But again, the share shrinks relative to other countries. So who else might be relevant in world power? Maybe Russia, thank you, uh, Emma. Um, and Harry is going to include Germany, Japan. Um, I'm going to include a few of these. And maybe, the, oh, I, Lauren, I 
love that. I'm going to stick to just countries for the time being, but yes, the EU would be a sizable, roughly 500 million individuals. Um, but in nation states, this, this is where it kind of gets interesting because when we think of world power, if the EU were an actual sovereign state and had unified and had uh, a unified military, for example, then our what we think of as the dynamics within international politics, following realist theory, for uh, for example, um, then it might be something uh, you know worthwhile to look at. But right now, it's still kind of a confederation at best, and that would probably be a a bit of an overstatement. Um, so we'll just look at nation states for the time being. But yeah, good point, Lauren. Thank you, um, China. And then let's go to Germany next. I believe was uh, requested there. Germany. There you are. Do we have data from North Korea or is that difficult to gather? Emma, another interesting question. We actually do have the DPRK. Uh, data is actually not difficult to get. It's just a little bit suspect would be the easiest way to say it. But we actually can do pretty good modeling with even the data from the DPRK. And I'll we can look at that, but you would probably expect the DPRK to be what it is, which is very authoritarian and very poor. Um, in so many uh, different categories. Okay, Nigeria. Thank you, Leila. Nigeria. I think I'll add Nigeria there. I think we had Russia and Japan. So don't let me forget those two. There's Japan and Russia. All right. And I'm going to go a little bit further now. I'm going to go out to 2050 because that's where things get interesting. Do a line graph. And I'm going to get rid of the messiness and just kind of focus on this area over here. There you go. So we have USA declining and China rising. And this is what not just we think, this is John Mearsheimer, political scientist, many, many groups uh, think the same thing. I'm going to clean this up a little bit and just use country names. There we go. And we can see all these other countries. So Nigeria, very low. Um, and all these other countries having about roughly 5% declining to about half that over time. So uh, Russia, Japan, Germany, all important countries and regionally consequential. Uh, Russia, we might uh, render a different scenario in which we increase the relative weight of nuclear weapons, which we do include, but we discount those considerably because only one country, this one right here, has ever used nuclear weapons against another country. So mutually assured discrimination. Uh, destruction, as it were, kind of deflates the relevance of nuclear weapons. And then everything else is, unfortunately, not really working for Russia with a uh, stagnant declining population, um, not the best GDP growth rates, etc. This is what's consequential right here, because what we think we know from researching power transitions over time is that the international system becomes destabilize when one country begins to decline and another, another country rises. There are exceptions like when Britain declined and the United States rose, but we think that that was relatively peaceful because of the shared understanding between the two countries and the shared institutions. And that could be exactly what happens between the United States and China when we go through this transition roughly at about uh, less than 10 years from now. Economic liberals, for instance, or liberals more broadly would rightly note the interdependency between our two countries. And that would keep us from engaging in outright conflict. We could have a Cold War. So it could look like what I grew up with, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union, or it could be even more hostile than that. But the point is, is we need to understand that this intersection will occur. And at that point in time, the world might change. Isn't the population of Nigeria going to explode? Why will its power not change? Uh, very good point, Layla. And, and the thing is, is that population is one component and we actually weight it positively or negatively depending on other endowments. So as Nigeria gets wealthier, healthier, and more educated, that, that population becomes more of a power boost, as it were, as opposed to right now where they do have a large population, but unfortunately very poor and de deficits in so many other categories. But to your point, if we go out even further, I'm going to keep Nigeria. Now I've kind of changed my countries. So let me go USA, China, go back to China. 
Okay, you're missing one other country. I am going to keep Nigeria, but you're missing one other country. Can you think of another country that might be very powerful by the time we get to 2100? Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Unfortunately, Great Britain, too small. It's going to stay in one of those 2.5, but it is, in fact, India. So let me grab, we have China, India, and we have Nigeria. If we go all the way out to 2100, and we do a line graph, and there we go. So again, I'm going to trim all this history here. There we go. This is what's, this is what is uh, truly exceptional when we think about, oh, I forgot the United States. How could I forget the United States? Sorry. There we go. And we'll try that again. And again, just focus on kind of our forecasted values. So this is where it gets very interesting because not only do we have one power transition, we have two. We have China rising, uh, the United States continuing to decline, and India rising. And Nigeria, point in fact, is our predicted or forecasted fourth uh, rising power in the years to come. But it will take a long time because we are talking about incredible uh, deficits with regards to human development in Nigeria. Um, so too with India, but India grows relatively quickly and is able to take advantage of those investments and uh, along with its very large population become a world power. Now, it did come up with uh, the question of hostilities. Luke, uh, great question here. Um, it, what about hostilities? What if, what if, you know, all the peace that we've more, and I say this more or less, enjoyed for most of these years. And when we think of the piece that we enjoyed, I'm, I'm really comparing that to the very, very difficult first half of the 20th century and before that. But for all intents and purposes, we have not had all out war, world war, as it were. Um, but what if that were to change? That's actually a scenario that we can run. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm only gonna focus on USA and China and this is where the model gets really interesting. We down here have a series of different scenarios. So we have our base case, kind of the same dynamics that we have now continuing and have had for many years continuing into the future. But what if, as Luke asks, the world becomes much more confrontational? And we focus on security first. Uh, security first assumes that we become more defensive. Not only do we engage in trade wars, but we get into Definitely not conventional war, definitely not nuclear war. There's higher rates of conflict conventional, definitely not nuclear war, um, but we're not simulating world war as it, as it were. That would be much more devastating. We're just, uh, we're just simulating a world in which hostilities increase. There is more conflict, more peripheral conflict, kind of like we had during the Cold War with the Soviet Union, not outright war with the other dominant superpower, but we trade less, we engage less, and for all intents and purposes, we have proxy wars and a cold war between the two superpowers and all powers, because that's the way the world aligns. Um, and honestly, I don't even have to go out to 2100, so I'll just bring it back into 2050. And what we can see with our base case and our security first scenario are very different worlds. And again, I'm gonna stick to just the forecast because obviously our alternative scenarios would not change the past, but they do change the future. What we can see here is that in the base case, China is held back significantly in its power. Its share declines by, it looks like about 27 to, oh, I can look, 27.9 uh, to 22.3. So China loses 7.6% of world power. And the United States loses as well, um, actually increases a bit because it's all relative. Um, so we have the uh, base case for the United States here at 14.5, and it regains a little bit to 17.4. But China still rises. So irrespective of what the United States and all other nations do, if hostilities increase, China still rises. It's just that everything else is kind of, all the uh, power dynamics are kind of shifted and the United States reclaims a bit more power and, and China loses power. China loses a lot more than just power. So we can go back to GDP per capita, for example, purchase power parity terms are in our forecast for the two countries. And this you can see, the United States loses. We spend more on weapons as it were, 
loses a bit. So in our base case, on average, we would think individuals would have an income somewhere around 80,000 and we lose, or the United States loses um, just 3.2 thousand per capita. But if we go back, look at how much China loses. The Chinese population, every individual, loses what they would have had, 53,000 on average income down to 32,000. So I can say that point of fact, if the world actually does look like this, then we have to introduce a number of other scenarios because we're talking about an amazing amount of loss for China. And arguably China would probably not respond with just accepting this new world order. It would probably respond in kind. And unfortunately, we might have a more, um, more conflict in the world than we even anticipate in this alternative scenario. And Antifrica, that's so I'm reading Simon's question here. Can I model a focus for one country and a different focus for another? For example, the United States fo focuses on security, but China doesn't. We absolutely can. Um, uh, great question, Simon. We can, these, uh, we call these framing scenarios that I'm going into now because they impact every country in the world, as we generally think. Um, but absolutely, you could have a uh, belligerent United States and a Pacific China. You could have vice versa. You could have that influence respective spheres. So maybe there is an alignment between the United States and NATO to be more belligerent, bellicose, whatever you want to call it. And maybe uh, the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization becomes much more Pacific. We absolutely can, either side of that. Any assumption that you think is plausible, you can implement in the model and see what actually happens for the entire world. So yes, um, the only thing that I would do, and this is what I coach my students, I'm teaching this course right now uh, with our undergraduate students. The only thing is every step of the way is you're working on plausible scenarios, right? So you want to build out a scenario, whether it's a what if or a policy oriented scenario that's actually doable or, or realistic or plausible. Um, and that requires you to do a lot of research on the country that you're interested in or region of the world that you're interested in to build out a forecast that is actually meaningful to your audience. And that's exactly the same work that we have to do whenever we work with a national government, intergovernmental organization or what have you. We have to do the work to fully understand why we would build a scenario that looks like this, that, or the other. Great question. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to one other category, the category that probably matters more than anything else, the environment. And actually we can have a whole addition of new indicators here. So I'll go open that up a little bit and then go back to the environment. And what I wanna look at is carbon emissions are important, uh, important obviously, and uh, so too is average temperature. Uh, da, 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 let me see if that's the one. Temperature change from CO2 from 1990 into the present. And I'm gonna look at the base case and Go out to 2050, that sounds about right. And use the only geography that actually matters, in my opinion, for climate change, the world. So um, folks at home, uh, who knows the degree change that we think is the tipping point once we realize it in degrees Celsius or centigrade, that when we reach it, we reach that tipping point and, become, and climate change becomes irreversible. Any thoughts? Maybe. Harry's thinking three, he's not quite sure, totally fine. Any other votes? Two degrees? I'm gonna take Harry and Layla and the average. We think it's about 2.5 degrees centigrade, or two degrees centigrade, uh, quite possibly. Two to 2.5, we'll go with two. Um, and you can see that by 2050, we do not hit that temperature change. But do we think we hit it by 2100? If not earlier. And the answer is unfortunately yes, it is two degrees. Um, and you can see that we crest that right around, oh, wait, I gotta move myself, sorry. Uh, right around here. So somewhere around um, 2060, we hit that tipping point in which climate change becomes irreversible. We still see it slowing down because renewables scale up and uh, the population stabilizes just like we talked about uh, when we started the conversation. So unfortunately that two degrees centigrade is the critical tipping point but that's not the one that we have to have, right? And actually all of these scenarios that we built down here, we did in partnership with the UN Environmental Program. And specifically because in their report, their report to the world, literally, what we wanted to do was build out these scenarios and then think about how we could actually um, avoid the irreversible 
effects of climate change. So we built a sustainability first scenario and we built a markets first scenario and we built a policy first. And of course the one we already looked at is security first. And we could look at all those different scenarios and then see a range of different temperature changes from CO2. So even if the world, um, you know, we might think that through technological innovation and if we became more economically liberal across for the entire world, that that innovation would bring about uh, the reversal in climate change that we need. But the problem is, is that we consume more, right? So if we all have greater incomes, then unfortunately we consume more and that offsets any of the gains that we get from innovation and new technologies that might enable us to grow sustainably. And you've already seen the base case. And of course, the security first is a little bit better because of increased, unfortunately, increased conflict and lower incomes, but is still a ruinous scenario as well. Only when we focus on the environment outright, and that is our sustainability first scenario right here. Let me just clear that and have just the scenario names. There we go. Um, only when we focus on the environment outright do we bend the curve in a sizable way, a truly meaningful way. And a lot of things have to happen for this scenario to be enacted. Doesn't mean we can't, it just means that we need to reorient our thinking around a new set of values, a new set of policies that enable us to not only avoid climate change, but avoid climate change uh, without question. Because of course, climate change is very difficult to simulate all the effects of climate change. Um, but if we really want to bend that curve downward, a lot of things need to happen. Um, we need to have less conflict. We need to have uh, more pro-poor policies in the developing world so that they can grow sustainably. Uh, are there halfway scenarios? Yeah, and that would be this one here that kind of comes in. Um, and I think honestly, our base case is a bit of a middle of the road, but uh, definitely policy first is kind of the middle of the road that's still better. Um, but what separates policy and uh, the sustainability scenario is that policy focuses on kind of the SDGs, the sustainable development goals in which we focus on all the things that we need to do. Um, but sustainability privileges the environment first. So it's kind of like a lot of the things that are in the SDGs, but the environment comes first. And that's why we get two very different curves. Um, so we need to do a lot of things. We need to have pro-poor development because then it's more sustainable and reduce conflict. Um, we even need to do things that are kind of counterintuitive, uh, like if developed countries actually had retirement, funded retirements for their citizens, earlier and enabled individuals to retire earlier, that's actually good for the environment because oddly enough, when people live uh, a life but work longer, they generally have greater incomes than they would if they were on a retirement income, which means consumption goes up. So all of these things kind of factor into an integrated scenario that says, if we did all these things, then absolutely we would avoid um, either in this scenario or this scenario, the tipping point for climate change. So that's why we do what we do. Uh, we, we figure out what we think is going to happen, most likely middle of the road, whatever um, terminology you'd like to use, and then build alternative scenarios to hopefully guide the thinking of national governments, intergovernmental organizations, as well as our students and our practitioners or faculty like myself. So at this point, what I'll do is, I think we've got a few minutes left. AJ, keep me on point just in case. But if anybody would like to look at anything else, we have a number of different categories. And I'm going to actually go to just our mainline ones here. Uh, we have a number of different categories that we can look at. So if there's anything you would like to look at, just let me know. You can say, I'd like to look at education, um, health, uh, life expectancy. The only thing I don't have, unfortunately, and this is the effects of COVID-19, which we're still working with the UNDP uh, to understand the long-term effects of COVID-19. Oh, I think I have something here. Nope. Can we look at education? Absolutely, Salma. Uh, education. And education, we have a number of different categories here. And literacy is pretty important, but it's a uh, limited indicator, right? Because it's a binary, uh, an individual is either literate or not. Um, and it kind of saturates. So once a person is considered literate, there's nowhere else to go. So we often look at uh, education years, 15 plus. And I'm gonna look at a few that might make sense here. Might make sense. We'll go back to China. We'll pick up Germany. 
And for uh, comparison, Ghana is a developing country and the United States. And we'll just go out to 2050 again. And again, our, our indicator is the average years of education, starting with 15 year olds, because that's where we really measure it. That's when you should have obtained the education that at least you can, it'll continue to grow, uh, all the way to the oldest individual in that society. So it's kind of a, well, it's an average, obviously, for all of society. So it still includes, as it were, in the United States, still includes my grandmother, who, again, was unable to finish high school way back when. And you can see that there have been incredible improvements. Let me just do first dimension. There we go. You can see that we've uh, had incredible improvements. China and Ghana, China having a little bit of an improvement above Ghana, uh, massive improvements from 1960 to where we are now, 2020. And we would, we would see that to continue in the years to come. Um, a little bit with Germany, Germany making up a lot more room than um, the United States, but saturation. And the reason being is we can change these assumptions within the model, but very few individuals do what I've done uh, and, or, and would have a need to do what I've done and seek out a, you know, two masters and a, and a doctorate. Uh, most individuals will saturate at about 13 years of education, 13 and a half in either country, uh, but there's still a deficit between these developing countries, a bit contentious whether or not China's considered a developing country, but still a deficit between these two countries. And mainly because it might look better if we were looking at just 15 year olds to 24 year olds, because those would not include my grandmother as it were um, within the measure, but we are, have, we have to count everybody. So those developmental outcomes and education are, can only grow as fast as they can grow, taking in consideration the entire population. But we do see increased educational attainment for years to come. How about, how long will we live? <laughs> That's actually under population, life expectancy. Any guess as to which population in the world lives the longest? I can tell you it's none of these four countries. And it's gendered, I can tell you that. Way to go, Harry! Iceland would probably be, oh, let's take a look. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see, Iceland is right about, I'm sorry, I just picked Indonesia. All right, I'll just do Iceland and Japan. JK, sorry, this is so much easier from when one is not zooming. And I'll look at males and females. Because point of fact, there are very clear differences. So the Icelanders are doing pretty good. Look at the disparity between uh, Japanese females and Japanese males. Um, so it's better to be an Icelandic male, but in every instance, it's better to be a Japanese female. That, that's the highest life expectancy. And if we were to look at this, uh, these curves all the way out to 2100, it's not gonna be linear. We see saturation, right? So, um, and now it, we actually have an, uh, an option within the model to change those assumptions as well. And we worked with Cambridge University, um, an individual out there uh, who has, who is rethinking all the, the assumptions behind life expectancy. And so we can actually flip the switch that causes life expectancy to be massively greater uh, than we're forecasting right now. But the point is, we don't have that technology. So we're going to have all kinds of new therapies um, that should extend life expectancy. But until those uh, new technologies come online, we would see pretty much life expectancy saturating for all countries that are out there. Um, again, doesn't mean we can't change the assumptions and push life expectancy to very high levels. And then we have to rethink all of our assumptions because if all of our populations live an additional 30, 40, 50 odd years, then that changes all of the impacts to every aspect uh, in the world as well and the world that we can actually model. So we keep life expectancy within bounded as it were, but an alternative scenario would see life expectancy growing much more higher than our average years of life expectancy as we have now and the world changing with it.
So I have a few minutes left. Um, any general questions? Can I model advancements in human rights or freedoms? Um, great question. We do. We model that under governance. And there's a few ways that we can look at governance and a litany of indicators. So I'll actually expand this a bit more. Okay, we have a number of different aspects of governance, whether that's democratization, civil and political freedoms. Um, and, and then we can also look at outcomes. So we can look at, unfortunately, violent deaths if there's a very um, horrendous, I, I guess that's the only way to say, say it, uh, government like uh, the crackdown that's going on in Myanmar right now. We could look at that as well. But these would be the main ones, democratization, the civil and political freedom. We can look at economic freedom as well, if, if we uh, kind of see that through the ability to um, build out new enterprises, whatnot. Uh, so absolutely. And just so I can let you know, because I'm sure you're wondering, no, we do not forecast China becoming democratic anytime soon. So this is China out to 2100, and this is still in the meso anno anno. It's always anocracy, as it were, um, but definitely far from China becoming a full democracy. Why? Because unless you know a, a second Tiananmen, a true revolution, what have you, occurs, this is the endurance of an authoritarian regime, and they are not likely to change. Um, they'll improve slightly as uh, varying degrees of freedom improve, but not. Has anyone ever made a model where the nationalists won the Chinese Civil War? Uh, not that I'm aware of, um, but it wouldn't be hard to do. What one would do is one would look at, for example, if we just look at uh, democracy and hold China and Taiwan. There's Taiwan. We're not making a political statement here. It's just a, a unit of analysis. So you can see Taiwan has a long tradition of uh, democratic rule. If we were to go back historically and implement democratization as well as all the other reforms that Taiwan implemented as it changed from an authoritarian regime to a democratic regime, we could absolutely do that for China um, uh, as a uh, historical backcast, as it were. What I have had uh, folks do is I have had folks looking at, let me pick another unit here. This one right here, Hong Kong. And you can see Hong Kong has endured and we are still forecasting Hong Kong to have a um, democratic future. Although of course that could change with new events. Um, and we actually, I have had students go in and um, build a very different Hong Kong uh, based on the assumptions that what is going on in Hong Kong right now continues. And we see more of a rollback of all of the freedoms that the Hong Kongers have enjoyed to more of an authoritarian regime that looks much more like China. The thing is, is that China's China and has China's historical and forecasted development. But when you really arrest the development of a country politically, uh, then other things would have to change as well. Uh, we can't just think of all the politics changing overnight and not wider impacts to uh, the society in Hong Kong. So we would see many things changing uh, with that initial notion of rolling back political reforms within the country. So yes, great questions. Um, I'm gonna hold it right there. If you have any questions at any point, if I can help you in any way, uh, better understand what I do at uh, Corbell, uh, what Corbell does more broadly. We do a lot of different things. We focus on a lot of different areas. Um, feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to help prospective students at any step of the way. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this and I hope this was helpful and I hope to see you here in the fall, hopefully in person as well. All right, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was just amazing. I had, I, I had no idea uh, of this program and, uh, you know, I learned a lot. I learned a lot too. So I'm um, just uh, really excited for all of our students here. And, you know, thank you so much for all of you who participated. Your participation made this a lot much uh, smoother and a lot much better. You know, they a lot of great questions, a lot of great um, participation coming from our students. So we just thank you so much for that. And thank you, Keith, for, you know, just being a great, great teacher and, um, you know, uh, teaching us about uh, all the things uh, that 
uh, you were going over. So that was really great. And thank you. It was very informative. And um, with that, uh, we are going to wrap uh, wrap up here. Uh, we do hope that you continue to explore what the University of Denver has to offer with uh, the rest of the programming that we have today and throughout the coming months uh, as you kind of make your decisions on where you're going to be calling home for the next four years. So we're really excited for that. Um, just a few things that are coming up today. If you are interested, 3 p.m., we have an accelerated master's program session about on, on education, uh, social work, law, and business. So those are for master's programs that uh, go beyond uh, undergrad. And then we do have sessions from the Debar Department of Economics, Mathematics, and then Media, Film, and Journalism Studies. And we do have a sample class in engineering and computer science as well. So that's all coming up at 3 p.m. So uh, if, you, if any of those interest you, uh, do sign up for those. And um, we hope to, you know, we hope that you take advantage of all these events and uh, we really uh, appreciate your time for being here with us today. Thank you, Keith, again, thank you so much for everyone uh, that was here and that participated and all your questions were amazing. So uh, we hope to see you, uh, like Keith said, we hope to see you here in the fall and uh, it, it was great to be with you here today. So uh, be safe. Be healthy and have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.